Welcome to Issues and Answers. You know, today we're going to talk about the Bible. Did you know that the Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek? Well, for some of you who are watching, you may still feel that it is in Hebrew and Greek because you do not understand it completely. We are going to go through how to study your Bible. Yes, a self-help study for you and for others who are wanting to know how to peruse through God's Word intelligently and proficiently. And to help us today are two very special guests, one whom we've had on another show. It is Daniel Mesa. He is pastor of the Revelation Promises Hope SDA Church and Maranatha Bible Fellowship SDA Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he has brought his best friend, Evangelist David Ashrick of the Mission College in the Black Hills in Hermosa, South Dakota. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's very nice to be here. So we are going to learn about how to study our Bibles. Well, I'm excited about this. Amen. So Where do we begin? We begin with David. Well, the Bible, it's interesting that you would say that it was written in Hebrew and Greek. It's actually written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. there was a third language. Do you know what it was? Aramaic. Aramaic, you got it. <laughs> uh, it. It was written in Hebrew. Of course, the Old Testament's in Hebrew and Aramaic, and the entire New Testament was written in Greek. And it's interesting to me that you would say that uh, many people might still feel like it's written in those languages because I have found that very few people really understand the Bible. I hate to say that. Uh, but as we travel around the country, uh, it's really perplexing to me, and I know to Daniel as a pastor, that there are very few people who really seem to have a grasp on the totality of Scripture, what's being taught. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bible is definitely a unique document. Uh, the Bible was written uh, on three different continents over a period of probably about 1,500 different years by not less than 37 different authors. Uh, these authors ranged in their vocations from uh, being a farmer, uh, Jeremiah was a scribe, uh, uh, Matthew was a tax collector, Peter was a fisherman. So uh, various socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, over 1,500 different uh, years, three different continents, and it all coalesces into one volume that we call the Bible, which is really 66 different books. And so when you're perusing this, uh, this volume, it's not, a, it's not a normal book. It's not a, uh, an ordinary book. It's unique. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we must... Uh, understand how to study this Bible and that's what we want to talk about today. Amen. Well I think it's neat that you're here because we had had Daniel tell us how he came to the Lord in our last program and I understand that there is a special story about your baptisms. Yes actually uh, I was in California baptized June 6th I think it was or July 6th and he was baptized the 8th two days apart. Um, he was in South Dakota and just a short time afterwards, the Lord brought us together, and at that point, we had become uh, best friends, and I had mentioned before that we wanted to work together. So we prayed together that the Lord would lead us together to work together, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been best friends ever since. So it's been quite a blessing. Wonderful. Amen. So, David, you're going to share with us some key principles and how right. to study or how to learn the Bible. Understand the Bible. Understand Amen. the Bible. Okay. We have five principles. We've distilled it down to five principles that if you will follow these five principles, uh, they're principles that are actually derived from the Bible itself. And if we'll understand these five principles, we will be able to arrive at an accurate understanding of what the Bible is teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to tell a little story. This is how some people study the Bible. Perhaps you've heard of this before. Uh, people will say, well, you know, I'm in such a hurry in the mornings that I just flip through and I just say, Lord, speak to me. And they open it up and, you know, they whatever the text is, you know, this is God's voice to them that day. And I'm not discounting the fact that God can do that. Uh, there's a little story, somebody's studying the Bible and, oh Lord, I'm in a hurry, I just need a quick devotion. And, and it says, Judas hung himself. <laughs> oh, this is not a particularly good devotion. So he closes it and he, Bruh. go thou and do likewise. Well, this is not a good study at all. So he says, Lord, I, need, I really need you to, to give me a good devotion this morning. So he goes one more time and it says, what thou doest, do quickly. Well, this is not a legitimate way to study the Bible, <laughs> no. obviously. And sadly, many people are employing these same kinds of principles. You know, we laugh at it. It's, it's clever. But people are employing these kinds of happenstance principles to understand the Bible. Uh, the Bible, as we have said, is a unique book. And God has given us ways, principles, in which we can uh, uh, use to understand the Bible. And these principles are derived from the Bible itself. Uh, we'll give five principles, as I've said. And the first principle is this. Um, I'm going to read here, if you'd like to look in your mm -hmm. Bible. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And here we find the, the first key that's going to help us to understand the Bible. Uh, we need to understand that the Bible makes an incredible claim about itself. Uh, prior to becoming a Christian, I studied into uh, Eastern religions. I read a, a large portion of the Hindu holy book called the Bhagavad Gita, as it is. Mm -hmm. I've read large sections of the Quran. I'm a voracious reader. But I have learned that no other holy book that I am aware of makes the claim to be the Word of God. The Bible is unique in that it makes that claim. Now, just because it makes the claim doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. But we have to treat this book as a unique book just by virtue of the fact that it makes the claim. Now, the key passage here I wanted to look at is all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the first principle that we derive from the Scripture itself is that in order to understand the Word of God, we must rely upon the author of the Word of God, who according to this verse, is God. Mm -hmm. And that's the first principle. Mm -hmm. Reliance upon God, upon the Holy Spirit, to lead us and to guide us. And Daniel, I know you're just charged up with the text here. That's right. I wanted to turn to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 gives us one of those principles of studying the Bible um, in reliance upon the Spirit, saying that all inspiration is given by, or I'm sorry, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The inspiration is, you know, by the Spirit. And in John 16, 13, we read, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, not just some, but all truth. And so the promise is that God will lead us through His Spirit mm -hmm. into truth. We're also told that the Bible is truth, that your word is truth. It says in John 17, 17. But if we finish the text, it says, For he shall not speak of himself. We learn in a few verses after and a few verses before he's speaking of Christ. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the promise here is just really quite a blessing. God's going to lead you through His Spirit into truth, but also reveal things to come. And just as David said, this is a unique book. This book has promised not only to reveal the will of God and lead us into truth, but things to come. So we don't always have to be in darkness, mm -hmm. not Amen. knowing the things, or only knowing the things that are behind and what are present. But God has promised also to reveal to us the future. So before we even open the book, we can know that as fact, that it's coming from God and that as we study God through the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit will guide us. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that's principle number one. Uh, because the Bible is a spiritual book, we can't just come to it like we would come to any other historical work or work of antiquity. We need to come to this book saying, Lord, you wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Now teach me the book. You know, he's going to be the best teacher if he's the author. Uh, I'm reading now from Second Peter just quickly. Uh, chapter 1, verse 19, he says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Mm -hmm. So it's not up to Karen to determine what the Scripture says, or David, or even Daniel. Well, how can we be so sure that the Scripture is not of private interpretation? The next verse is the key. He says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, Amen. but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the holy, holy Ghost. Ghost. So we've seen just three scriptures right as we get started here that the Holy Spirit is, is the one who wrote the Bible through the prophets, mm -hmm. but the Spirit was the one inspiring. And so when we come to the Word of God, principle number one is it's not David's uh, intellectual uh, prowess or David's education that's going to help him to understand the Word of God, but it's going to be David's reliance upon the author of the Word of God. That's principle number one. Well, you know, I think back on how you said how you met. You know, my brothers are David and Daniel as well. Mm -hmm. And so here's a David, here's a Daniel that are two worlds apart, but yet the Lord has brought them together. Amen. So the same Holy Spirit and the same God who can bring people together through circumstances can guide us through His Word as well. Amen. That's right. That's good. Amen. I like that. Well, our second principle is not just that the Spirit teaches us, principle number one, but the second principle is that the theme of the entire Scripture from the beginning to the end is actually Jesus Christ Himself. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the theme of Scripture. In fact, go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. For those of you at home, that's in the New Testament. That's the fourth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 5 and verse 39. Jesus here is, is discussing 
uh, uh, some issues with the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. These were the intelligent people of Jesus' day. And Jesus says this in John chapter 5, verse 39. He says, search the scriptures. And in the days of Jesus, of course, the scriptures would have been just Genesis to Malachi. The mm -hmm. New Testament would not yet have been written. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, search the Old Testament. Why? Why should we search it? For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is saying, from Genesis, all the writings of Moses, all the way up through uh, all of the chron chron chronicles and the chronologies, through the kings, through Samuel, all the way through all the Old Testament prophets, he says, all of those scriptures, they testify of one central theme. The pulsating bottom line of scripture is Jesus. So when we're going into the Bible, we're looking not for little details here and little idiosyncrasies here and little nuances here. We're looking for the vast theme, Jesus. Amen. You know, that reminds me of another scripture, David. Um, in Luke chapter 24 and uh, verse 25, Jesus actually believed the same thing that David was just talking about, how that the whole entire scripture refers to himself. He's mm -hmm. the central theme. And in verse uh, 25 of Luke 24, it says, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Amen. And so from Moses, just like David was talking about the Old Testament, when he said, search the scriptures, he's referring to Genesis to Malachi. Jesus took Moses and all the prophets and expounded or opened up, unpacked mm -hmm. the scriptures about the things concerning himself. And, you know, that reminds me of, a, of an illustration I like to teach. Um, when we're studying the Bible, we should do something what's called, as Jesus said, expounding the scriptures, but I call it unpacking the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And it's much like you take a suitcase. Okay, you pop it open, you open it up, and you see that you've got in there a few folded items of, of clothing. Well, you see a shirt there, and you don't really know the shirt much because it's folded up, so you take it and you unfold it a little bit here, you unfold it a little bit there, and find it's a short sleeve shirt. Mm -hmm. And then you unfold it here a little bit, and you, oh, there's, there's an emblem on it, Jesus loves me. Okay? You unfold it again, and you find it's a white shirt with the emblem, Jesus loves me. You turn it over, and it says, Jesus loves you too. So now you know the full, broad scope of this shirt. Well, then you put it on. Okay? You go into your... Uh, suitcase again and pull out what looks like a pair of shorts but you unfold it and or unpack it as it were and it's um, all of a sudden a pair of pants with your you know perfect pockets and the kind that you like perfectly and just your size so you slip that one on too you do the same thing with the sweater do the same thing with the hat and all the other things you unpack them find out all about them whether you like them or not and if they fit and then you put them on in the same way we should be able to take the scriptures and we should search the scriptures and expound everything, the things concerning to Christ. And so you can take one scripture, any, any scripture, and pull the first word. For instance, for God so loved the world. What does God mean? Unfold that. Make it big. Make it real. Apply it to yourself. Mm -hmm. For God so loved. So is obviously an emphasis on loved. What does love mean? What does it mean to so love in opposite of, or in, uh, next to just loving? And so you can unpack these things and then put that article of word on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, really it's the unpacking of the scriptures is something that we should try to do every time we study. Mm -hmm. There's a point I wanted to say on that. And what Daniel's talking about is almost like he would go into a laboratory and use a microscope. Uh, say you had a, uh, a piece of tissue here. Some, you know, maybe it was a piece of skin or something. And you, you get under the microscope and you really peer in and look at all of the details mm -hmm. of, of what you're looking at. But there's not just a microscope involved here because if we were just spending all of our time looking mm -hmm. at, uh, at the little uh, uh, minutia, we wouldn't understand, mm -hmm. well, what is the big picture? Mm -hmm. And so there's not just a microscope. That's point number three, by the way, Daniel. Uh, there's a telescope. There's a telescope. You see, we, we don't want to just stay honed in on all the little words. We have to do that. But then we have to back away and be sure that the conclusions that we've reached from that text agree with the conclusion of the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. So point number one is reliance upon the Holy Spirit. Point number two is that all of the scriptures point to Jesus. He's the central theme of scripture. Point number three is unpacking the scripture, letting every word have its proper bearing. God so loved the world. And point number four is that all of the conclusions that we reach from a particular uh, understanding of a verse 
need to agree with what the other things that the Bible says. For example, you know, uh, we did our little illustration, you know, G Judas hung himself, go thou and do likewise, what thou doest, do quickly. Well, you could arrive at that conclusion, but that would not be a conclusion that's consistent with the rest of Scripture. Mm -hmm. In fact, look at the book of Isaiah. This is point number four here. The book of Isaiah is in the Old Testament, uh, not long after Psalms, through Proverbs, through Ecclesiastes, through Song of Solomon. And you come to Isaiah chapter 28. Our fourth point here is a very important scriptural point. In Isaiah chapter 28, uh, beginning in verse 9, uh, there's a question being asked here by the prophet Isaiah. The question is mm -hmm. this, Whom shall he, that's God, whom shall God teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. In other words, God teaches his spiritual insights to those who are uh, desiring to be mature in the things of God. Not just those that are babies, uh, you know, suckling uh, uh, from the mother's milk, but those that are interested in actually learning and studying, the more, you'd say, spiritually mature. Here's how he does it, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You see, Karen, this is our fourth point. Mm -hmm. God teaches us not just in one verse. He teaches us many things out of a single verse, but what he teaches us in that single verse needs to be consistent with what he shows us in the rest of Scripture. Mm -hmm. How does he do that? The Bible is internally consistent. So what he says in Genesis is consistent with what he says in Revelation. What he says in Isaiah is consistent with what he says here and there. Mm -hmm. And so we bounce. What does Isaiah say about it? What does Jeremiah say about it? What did the wise man Solomon say about it? What did Samuel say about it? What do all of the various Bible writers say about a given topic? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And one of the key ways that you can do that, you know, we might have somebody sitting at home today mm -hmm. saying, well, how can I do that? How can I go from here to there? I don't know where to go. I'll give you a key word that often comes up go when ahead. you talk to people. Wine in the Bible. Wine in the Bible. How Good. can I do a research on wine in the Bible? Excellent. If you wanted to do research on wine in the Bible, what you would do is you'd go to your local Christian bookstore, you'd pick up a book called a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. There are many different concordances, but the one I recommend is the Strong's Exhaustive. It was compiled by a man named James Strong back in, I think, the 1600s. Mm -hmm. It's not a commentary. It's a reference tool that lists alphabetically every word that appears in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So you'd go through the A's or the B's or the C's, and you'd eventually come to the W's, and you'd look up wine. And it would have there all of the times that wine occurs in the Bible. So what you would do is you'd say, what, what was wine of the Bible in Genesis? Look up those references. What was it in Exodus? Look up those references. What was it in all the way through? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And as you looked up the totality of what the Bible says about wine in, in, in all of Scripture, mm -hmm. then you would have a biblical understanding of what the Bible teaches about wine. Mm -hmm. That's the telescope. Mm -hmm. Daniel talked about the microscope. You might take one text that mentioned wine in it, and you'd unpack the Scripture and say, oh, okay, so I understand what this is teaching. But you'd better be sure that the conclusion that you arrive at in your, t in your microscope agrees with the telescope. You understand? That's right. Uh, if you're looking uh, at a little cell tissue uh, here underneath the microscope, when you pan out, you're looking at, say, a cat, or you're looking at, you don't know what you're looking at precisely, but as you pan out, what you see panning out always agrees with what you see panned in. Mm -hmm. You're not adding anything new. Mm -hmm. All of it has to agree, and that's the fourth principle, biblical consistency. And this is one of the great uh, ways that we can know that the Bible is inspired. Mm -hmm. As we've suggested, written by uh, uh, 37 different authors on, on three continents over a period of 1,500 different years, and yet they agree in every detail and every specificity with one another. I mean, this is incredible. On no doubt, the most controversial subject in all of human existence, God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Total internal consistency, and that's point number four. And you know, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ even believed in the consistency of the Bible because we've already mentioned in Luke 24 where he went from Moses and expounded unto them all the things concerning himself through all the prophets. Mm -hmm. We also learned that Paul did the same thing if you read through uh, Romans chapter 3. He basically took the scriptures, the Old Testament, took uh, sections of scripture, compiled them into one section, and uh, taught us about the depravity of man's human nature. But there's another section of scripture that I'd like to turn to, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And referring to what David was, was talking about in Isaiah 28.10, um, here a little, there a little, line upon line, and precept mm -hmm. upon precept. We have the same thought in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13, referring to the Spirit of God re revealing to us things that are unknown to normal people. We are spiritual people, verse 13. 
which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing I like about the Bible is that it is research uh, and intellectually sound. Mm -hmm. The Bible has footnotes. And like you were saying, the Strong's Concordance. Well, isn't there a mini version of that in the Bible? That's right. I appreciate you having said that. Uh, in the center of, of many Bibles, you'll find uh, between the two columns, you'll have a, a kind of a reference point here. And this is what's called a marginal reference. Let's see if we can get a picture of that. Sometimes it's called a center column reference. Uh, Just turn it, your Bible around there and let's see what In that center column shot reference here. that you have right here, uh, basically what you have is, uh, for example, here's a, a, a bold uh, chapter 1, verse 2. And these are going to be other scriptures that reference the same topic that you're dealing with mm -hmm. in this scripture. Mm -hmm. Now this becomes very, very helpful for you, especially if you're not extremely learned in the things of the Word of God. When you first come, you, you, you pick up the Bible and you can just go to any place. You pick it up and as you read this verse, then you, you have, say here, four or five or six other scriptures that are going to reference similar, similar topics like wine mm -hmm. or angels or hell or death or love, any of these topics. And you can just bounce back and mm -hmm. forth, a, a marginal reference here, a 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 reference here. This is a systematic way to go through the Bible and be sure that the conclusions that you're arriving at, led by the Spirit, mm -hmm. looking for Jesus, unpacking the individual words, allowing the totality of Scripture to, to have its bearing upon Genesis to Revelation, all of it making the same sense mm -hmm. together, a unified document. These are the first four principles. If you follow these, you can be sure that the conclusions that you're arriving at are accurate and most of all, biblical conclusions. Well, that's very interesting. Now, can you give us a practical example of how to do this? I think so. Uh, in my marginal reference here, for example, the scripture that Daniel just read to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, uh, the verse is, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, as I look at my marginal reference here, it refers me to chapter 1 of that same book, verse 17. Okay. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And clearly here, the marginal reference is on that word wisdom. Mm -hmm. So we learn over here that we're not looking for man's wisdom, we're looking for the wisdom that God teaches by comparing spiritual with spiritual. Paul over here further elaborates on the idea of man's wisdom and how it's insufficient to lead us to a, a correct understanding of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to enlarge upon that even further, what, is, what, what, what does the New Testament have to say about man's wisdom? What does the New Testament have to say about God's wisdom? The two. What does the whole Bible have to say about wisdom? And as you bring that microscope and pan out, pan out, pan out, pan out, you're going to have a very biblical understanding of man's wisdom versus God's wisdom. There's never an ending to, to learning God's Word, is there? Amen. I love that. And there's an important point that I, I need to make on this, and that is this. Uh, many of the Bibles that people have today are called, maybe you've heard of this before, study Bibles. Mm -hmm. uh, and what this means is basically you go into a, a bookstore, a Christian bookstore, and they'll have a, a study Bible. I've seen the women's study Bible and the men's study Bible and the, even the African-American study Bible, the mm -hmm. prophecy study Bible, the father's study Bible. What that means is, is that man has now put his comments on to what the Word of God says. Now so, those are not all bad in that somebody's done a study, but then that, we have not done a study, That's right? exactly <laughs> right. It's not that these things are bad necessarily. However, we need to be uh, very careful to understand that somebody else's conclusions might not mm -hmm. be the right conclusion or the biblical conclusion. Mm -hmm. So I just, there's a warning, there's a caution there. Nothing mm -hmm. against study Bibles as such, but be sure that the conclusions that you're drawing are the conclusions that God's wisdom has taught you not what man's wisdom has done. And the best way to do that is to study for ourselves. That's exactly right, following the principles that we've been speaking of mm -hmm. right now. You've got it. Amen. So we've got our four principles. Mm -hmm. Principle number one is that we rely totally upon the Spirit. Principle number two is that Christ is the great central theme of the Scriptures. Principle number three is unpacking all of the particularities, the words, the, the nuances of an individual verse or passage. Point number four is that all of what we learn has to be internally consistent so it doesn't, the Bible doesn't teach that black is white on this side and white mm -hmm. is black on this side. It's always black is black and white is white. It's internally consistent. And point number five, Karen, is, is a very important one. And it, it has to do with application. When God teaches us something in His Word, it might require a change in the way we're living, the way we're conducting ourselves, the way we think, the way we uh, uh, move, the way we breathe, the way we live, the way we talk. It might require a change. And if it does, we need to be willing to, to do what God has shown us. And I think Daniel has a scripture here that he's just 
desiring to show us. I do. It's Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. Mm -hmm. And this is a blessed passage, one that I took very, uh, made very close attention to when I became a Christian. It says in verse 19, If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. And so mm -hmm. applying everything that you have um, learned as a result of Bible study at the end of your study. You know, being it. willing, like you said, I think that's, that's key. Anytime you to go into a new exercise, or into a, a, a new job, or for mm -hmm. a new class even, you have to be willing to be taught. You have to have a teachable spirit. That's right. And uh, surely we need to have that as we open God's Word, wouldn't you say? Amen. 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 That's right. And be willing to do the things that God shows us. I'll just quote you a, a, a beautiful scripture in John 7, 17. Jesus says, If any man will to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Jesus says, if you want to know the will of God, you must first be willing to follow the will of God. See, God is not just showing us things in the Bible to satisfy our insatiable curiosity for, for understanding and for wisdom and for knowledge. When God reveals something to us, He wants us to follow it, to love it, to believe it, to live it. Amen. And that's principle number five. What God has shown, let us walk in. You know, my dad, he used to say things to me. He'd say, David, I want you to clean your room. He wasn't telling me just to clean my room from my understanding. He wanted me to clean my room. And so it's, it's not just that we look at what God has said. Oh, this is neat. God has said that thus and so is sin. Well, that's great. Now I know that it's sin. God says it's sin. And if you're involved with it, in it, why don't you depart from it? Why don't you leave it? And a willingness to, to follow what God has shown us. This, this makes all the difference. God will teach those people who are willing to obey, who are willing to listen, who are willing to learn, who are willing to follow. And that's principle number five. Let us apply the principles that we've seen. Amen. Well, let us pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us all Amen. as we study God's Word to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as He teaches Amen. us. Amen. Will you offer prayer for us, please, David? I'd love to. Our great Father in heaven, uh, we rejoice to see today that you have revealed to us uh, principles, Father, derived from your Word that will enable us to understand your Word. Lord, what a blessed privilege we have that you have given us this special book and we ask now that as people that have been listening, they've learned these principles, they see that they're biblical, as they go to study their Bibles, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth as you have promised in John 16, 13. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you have today taught us how to study it. 